an art history quiz? Sorry? Actually, if you read the numbers, there's only three or seven. Yeah. <laughs> this is called multi-phase figuring, Charlie. Multi-phase and multi -scale. It's not a figure. You've just labeled drugs. <laughs> I learned from the best. space, and instead of doing a little paintbrush, you dot a little circle and call that day. And if you do that over the entire sky, you can get something very pretty, like the picture on the left. So that's exactly what we've done um, for the galaxy with uh, the Dark Energy Spectroscope Instrument, or DESI. So that brings us to figure two. So figure two is now in the lactocenter center coordinates, right, the big hole, um, like the big black region is the, the southern galactic path, where we don't really have access to because it is on the north. But this figure, despite it looking like a painted picture, it really is a pointless rendition of what the galaxy's cold gas content is. So by that, what I mean is, um, for every point on this map, um, we have gone in and looked at the galaxies uh, observed with DESI. And that brings us to the sort of not pretty panel in figure two, the, the one with the squiggly lines. So at, for every point, we have measured the galaxy spectrum, we have divided the galaxy model from the spectrum, and then stacked the model residuals in this tiny patch of the sky. So the circle size can vary, of course, but right now we're looking at like an 11 arc minute circle, so like a really small one on the sky. And in that residual, we look for absorption profiles, such as the one you can see. 
you see four sets of, or four little individual absorption lines. That's actually a pair of pairs, so two pairs of doublets. And from this, you can infer properties of absorber resistance between you and the galaxy on average. So it's sap. This says, is that right? 712 galaxies went into making this. Yep, that's why. You have really good vision. <laughs> Quite small. I had it this close. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get where your glasses are from. Um, yeah, so you repeat that over wherever Desi has looked in the sky, which is actually quite a good chunk of the sky, about a third. And then you can build this pointless rendition of gas. Sorry, what, the, what, the, what is the color bar? The color bar, okay, I, won't, I don't want to go into detail, but the color bars are the equivalent width of the, the total absorption. So the equivalent width in angstroms. What is the resolution? Of the resolution of Desi is around 3,000 at this wavelength range. Um, so R3000, so each pixel is around 0.8 angstroms, or 0.88 angstroms. So this is representing fluctuations on the level of like two to three pixels uh, combined. Without the uh, redshift, what about the redshift? Well, we divide out all the models, so the redshift is incorporated into that model as well. Okay, so that's after taking the redshift out. Yep. And what is left, you're showing us the residual. Exactly. Of what? Of what? Can you explain what we're actually Oh, gas in the galaxy. Sorry, right now. What, what line? Oh, okay, so that, that brings us to the second figure, right? So, so this, um, if you look at the wavelength range, um, which you can't really see, it's 50 and 90 angstroms. And it's a doublet, which is the sodium doublet. So figure two, again, is a pointless rendition of the sodium D um, absorption in the galaxy. On the bottom right panel, it is a very similar figure made with H1 emission. So now we're looking at 0.1 centimeter emission. And of course, this is. So I think you're, you're, you've, you've, there's galaxies behind, and it's illuminating gas in the foreground. Mm. Oh, is it gas so of the galaxies or yeah, gas of our so galaxies? Oh, okay. you're missing the. All right, all right. Well, so the, the right panel is H1 emission, actually. So right, but, yeah, the middle panel is taking absorption between the galaxy and us. So because we have subtracted out the model of the galaxy, it's looking at us which is the galaxy, so capital G Milky Way galaxy, gas in our galaxy. And just so that you educate us, yes. uh, sodium is not in the atmosphere of stars, it's in the interstellar medium, is that right? So there's both. Um, so sodium is in the atmospheres of cool stars. Okay, um, so how do you take that out? So um, in several ways. One, a lot of these galaxies are rotationally broadened. So with Desi's resolution, the intrinsic absorption from the stars would be very, very wide on the order of at least four to five pixels. And again, we're looking at absorption in one to two pixels. So from that rotational broadening, you can tell that this is not coming from a source that is rotationally broadened by you know, the galaxy's rotation curve. Um, and two, basically the strength as well. Um, the strength is, it corresponds to about the, the calm densities you expect in the galaxy, and also the velocity or the centroid of location as well. If the absorption was coming from the galaxy itself, it would, prefer, it would be, of course, redshifted to the galaxy's redshift. Um, but as you can see, the black lines sort of indicate where the redshift um, of zero is. So the fact that one, it is very narrow, two, it is coming from redshift zero, means that it's coming from the galaxy. I think another way of putting it is you, you pick galaxies that, you know, in this wavelength range, don't have much going on in their spectrum. So you can choose their redshifts in such a way that they're kind of more like quasars, right? They're like flattish spectra. And that model division helps with that also. So if you because of the redshift, so you just use them as a flat, they continue to solve. Yeah, well, yeah, not in detail. There, there, there is features in the, in the continuum, or absorption so features. what you're trying to do is map our own halo or something? Exactly. Okay. Apologies that totally went out the window. I will do. Uh, <laughs> so, are we all on the same page now, in terms of what we're looking at? And it really becomes clear, if you look at the bottom right panel now again, that is an already existing map of galactic H1 from emission surveys. And you can see the very striking similarities between these two maps. So again, this is H1 emission. So it is not a you know, point um, viewing source anymore. It's a continuous, contiguous, and continuous swap of the sky. And you're looking at emission from um, H1 21 centimeter. And Jesse, there, you, there's, there's a pair of doublets, so that means there's two absorbers. Is that Let's right? Get to that in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, just but, to make yeah. sure that, that this isn't like a stellar spectrum and then the 
high SIM absorption or the CGM absorption? This is two C no. CGM absorption features. Uh, yeah, so these are all galaxies. And, okay, so going, going into the nitty gritty details, I guess. Um, so if you take this residual, right, and you see multiple pairs of absorptions, um, we can attribute these independent pairs of absorption to different clouds in the galaxy. Because along the line of sight, right, um, it is not likely that we will encounter only one cloud or one sodium cloud um, between us and the rest of the halo. So in this case, the interpretation that I would suggest is the pair that is right close to the black lines, which is zero velocity, that's coming from the local ISM, right? Because approximately speaking, um, the local interstellar medium is at rest with respect to the sun, the difference of like 10 kilometers a second. Um, and then the redshift of one, uh, which is redshifted at around 100 kilometers a second, will be still in the halo, but not in the ISM, not in the local ISM. So that would be my interpretation. Uh, the, uh, the plot that you have here shows a fairly optically thin uh, emission. Is that true for all of them, or do you have some where it's really saturated and it becomes very uncertain? So um, it's, it's kind of hard to say, actually. So when we look at the distribution of, so what Strom is saying is, if you look at the ratio of the doublets, um, so the stronger one versus the weaker one, that ratio tells you something about the optical depth. So if it's closer to 2 to 1, which is the sodium D's intrinsic um, line ratio, that tells you that it's optically thin. But if it becomes close to 1, that can happen when the medium is optically thin. And that's because of curve of growth, and you can have D1 and D2 growing at a similar rate. Um, so in terms of measurements of optical depth, um, it's really difficult at the DESI resolution to get a really good handle of the line ratios, mainly because, again, we're looking at absorptions that are wide as 1 or 2 pixels. So to really get a good handle on is this 1 to 2 or is this 1 to 0.5, it's, um, it's a little more difficult. And when you plot the overall distribution of line ratios, it's consistent with your priors. So I wouldn't go as far to say that we solidly detect optically fit versus thin, um, but the information is there in principle. And why is the galaxy dark in 20 months in uh, H1? Um, it's not dark, it's just that I forward model the H1 emission map to precisely the DESI map as well. Wow. So you're comparing apples to apples. And of course, I'm masking out the entire disk, which is why you're seeing a lot of these off planar structures. Go ahead. Great. Keep going. Keep going, all right. <laughs> okay, so with that all like packaged in, this is a point where you can ask, like, why do we even care then, right? We already have a great map of the galaxy in H1, as you can see. Why do we need sodium D? And the answer really lies in the phase that is probed, right? So H1, with its ionization potential of 30.6 eV, um, is famously known to exist in a bimodal distribution, right? So sodium, sorry, H1 can exist in either the whole neutral medium, the CNM, or the warm neutral medium, WNM. And the temperatures can range from the CNM from a few hundred kelvins to the WNM being up to like 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So when you're looking at H1 emission, you're actually getting a combination of two phases that we think about separately. So you can think of sodium D, which has an ionization potential of like around 5 electron volts, so much uh, lower than H1, as a cleaner probe of purely the cold phase um, of gas. So but isn't CO a good probe of really cold gas? Absolutely, yeah. But CO is more at the molecular level, right? Yeah. And we're looking at the transition from ionized gas into atomic gas into molecular gas. The next level down. Exactly, yeah. So in terms of thinking about how gas actually turns into stars eventually, we're looking at the transition region between atomic gas um, and basically molecular gas. But more specifically, while H1 probes a sum of two bimodal uh, distributions, sodium is sort of looking at the unimodal cold neutral medium. That makes sense. So you can show that in multiple ways. And I think one sort of neat way to show that is indeed um, to correlate it with known CNM features. So if you take the H1 map, um, what folks have done is you can decompose the H1 map into large angular modes and small angular modes. So the sort of interpretation is that the more diffuse large angular scale structures in the H1 map traces the warm phase. And the more dense and cold phase stuff um, precisely traces the cold neutral medium. So on figure three, 
right? In the y-axis and the x-axis, what I'm now plotting is the H1 measure column density, and on the x-axis, the inferred sodium D column density. So the largest figure is just showing you all the sum of um, all the respondents. So like the y-axis will be the H1 quoted column density at both the CNM and the WNM, and the x-axis is just total integrated uh, sodium D column density. And you can see that it's actually quite a fair one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one um, -one line from 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 22, so over nearly two orders of magnitude in column density. So that's me. But again, if you, de you can decompose now the y-axis into stuff that belongs to large angular scales, let's say larger than 30 arc minutes, or smaller angular scales, smaller than 30 arc minutes. And that's the two panels directly to the right of figure three. Top panel is probing small scale H1 structure. Bottom panel is looking at large scale H1 structure. Try this question. I can read my furrowed brows. Very well. right. um, how do you, I'm sorry, how do you define small scale H1 and large scale H1 in practice? So in practice, what you can do is you can either take a Gaussian high pass filter and then filter out the, the small scale from the large scale. Or another neat way to do it is you can smooth the entire map using a beam size of your choice, let's say 30 arc minutes, and then subtract that map from the original map. And basically count the density peaks um, as your small scale structure, and then the rest what is remaining as the large scale structure. So this method has been used by folks like Peak and Susan Clark um, in the past before. Um, and it's, you know, the 30 arc minute scale is an arbitrary figure, but it just shows you um, features that are larger than that angular scale and features that are smaller than that angular scale. So in other words, like if you went to like a correlation function, yep. like a cross correlation function, it would be much stronger on small scales between sodium and Absolutely. Sodium. So if you take the power spectrum and cut it off at some arbitrary magnitude, you're correlating sodium with one feature and the other. Um, uh, one thing I'd yes. just like to point out, because people may not notice it, the scale of the uh, sodium D in figure 3 is scaled by a factor of 10 to the 9. Mm -hmm. That is much larger than the abundance ratio. So only like 1 in 10,000 sodium atoms neutral or rest or ionized mm -hmm. because the ionization potential is so small. Absolutely. So uh, what John is saying precisely is that sodium D is not sodium. So sodium is mostly ionized. So sodium-2 is the prominent ionization state of sodium. Um, so sodium-D is actually not a good tracer of sodium itself. Um, but clearly, it's a better tracer of H1, or the total content of atomic hydrogen, um, than it is of like sodium itself. So how do you make the ionization correction? Oh, you don't, because I'm not interested in the sodium oh. abundance. I'm interested in the amount of whole gas in atomic um, form. So actually, just the on this yes. point, I was confused. So you've got the sodium absorption. Yeah. You've got two kinds of clouds, 10 to the 4 Kelvin and maybe 10 to the 2 Kelvin. Yeah. And you're telling me that 10 to the 4 will have no sodium absorption at all. And the 10 to the 2 will produce essentially all of your signal. And then I keep thinking, you know, the sun is 5,000 degrees. It's got a booming sodium D absorption, so what am I missing, you know? Mm -hmm. Why would 10,000 just uh, have no sodium? So uh, the quick answer there is like, there is sodium in 10 to, 10 to the 4 Kelvin as well. Just the ratios, if you look at H1 emission of the 10 to the 2 stuff and the 10 to the 4 stuff, is most of the emission is coming from the 10 to the 4 stuff. Versus if you look at sodium, and there's 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 4, most of it is coming from the 10 to the 2. Okay. Um, with respect to the um, solar atmosphere. It's again John's point about what fraction is neutral. And the fraction that's neutral is a lot in, at 10 to the 2K and uh, really tiny at 10 to the 4K. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is, there, is there not a really strong density factor there too? No, because it's exponential in temperature. No, it actually is the density because it's photo ionization rather than collisional ionization. Oh, it's not collisional. It's photoemission, yes, but the recombination is correctional, right? Right. So, that's so why you are balancing recombination with ionization, and what's the dependence on temperature? Uh, it's relatively weak. Ah, so it's mostly density. Yeah. Well, then it's not quantum density, it's density. Well, that's what you say if you're looking at the next slide. 
and then slice happened to be cold. No, but so. quantum density has another parameter, which is the size of the cloud. I can have the same quantum density with two different densities. So how do you know what you're looking at in terms of density? Well, for the galaxy, you have quantum densities with, you know, well-defined. In this case, the quantum, the quantum size would be your beam size. So I don't think that's a confusion factor per se. Oh, you resolve the cloud, you're saying? No, but in three dimensions, I think Avi is saying, like, you could have a clump that's quite dense mm -hmm. along your line of sight and generate a high column density. Sure. Or you could have it evenly spread along the, like, yeah, you could, axis. You, you know could imagine I mean? that, absolutely. That would lead to different velocity structures as well, which I think you would recognize in higher resolution structure. Okay, interesting. Um, but I don't think that's enough to cause an order of factor of 100 difference in common densities. I see. Because then you'd have to make something very, very small and very, very long, very incoherent to confuse the field of velocity. And remember that the, your aperture is six arc minutes right now. So you'd have to shrink something very, very small and very thin and long and coherent to be able These to These are confuse. for filaments and they are also. Right, absolutely. So I agree that there is some sort of confusion but the there. Same geometrically, it's still no probability for it to line up with your lines. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, I have a, I have a naive question. I, I thought the cold neutral medium was not that cold. It goes from like 50 to 500 Kelvin in the literature. Oh. At least that's the H1 literature. <coughs> we have yet to start the sodium literature, so. Um, <laughs> that's also a measure. Is it true that there are distinct phases, that there is no continuum of temperatures? So if you look at the panel exactly the right, we'll get to that in a second. So can I tag this for like one minute? All right, so we've asked the question of why do we care about sodium? And the sort of answer was we would like to really parse between the warm phase and the cold phase. And the next question is why do you care about the cold phase? And one of the answers is, because this is an ITC discussion. Um, the cold phase really is, happens to be a place where a lot of simulations produce a variety of results, right? So for example, um, the top panel and figure four is an excerpt from a recent annual Reuss article. Um, and it shows a picturesque description of what cold gas could be doing in the galaxy. So the bottom panel is the largest sort of scales, intergalactic scales right now. And you can see, at least in this figure, there are these large coherent cold streams or cold mode accretion going on to the center of the disk. Um, there's also intergalactic cold gas being transferred from a satellite galaxy nearby. And there's also cold gas being um, entrained in this giant galactic outflow in the center of the galaxy as well. And basically, all of these things are contested across simulations. Right? The whole classic picture of cold mode versus hot mode accretion um, really depends from what you assume about your everything. Um, and in the smaller scales, if you zoom into the cold clouds themselves, mm -hmm. whether or not they are monolithic coherent cold clouds, or if they fragment into smaller mist structures, also depends on what you assume about their thermodynamical instabilities in your halo. It also depends on magnetic fields, cosmic rays, and all that. And at the very, very small scale in the ISM, that brings us to the bottom curves in figure four, um, this is exactly what Avi is asking about. The content, the mass content of gas in the cold phase versus the warm phase uh, depends greatly on what you assume about the physics. So the red line and the orange line, uh, which are both confusing actually, uh, they are both very modern simulations that attempt to resolve the ISM physics. Yet there is a factor of, sorry? It's the orange line. Oh, I mean I see it as a, right, red and magenta, sure. Yeah. The one is not, not blue, <laughs> <laughs> which I realize some people in the crowd do have <clears throat> issues. But um, the point here is that in the cold phase, basically, you can range from having 50% of the mass in your cold phase to 25% of the mass. So like order unity fluctuation in how much mass is stored in the cold phase. And I'll be asking if it really is binomial distribution and not like a continuous thing. Um, so at least modern simulations will tell you that it is a sort of binomial distribution, bimodal distribution between the cold and the warm phase. Do we not know if this is answered from just arithmetic from the data? 
We do not, no. Because with the H1 data, you either get a very limited view of the cold phase from continual absorption, and the WNM and the UNM is really invisible to you. The what NM? Uh, the, sorry, the unstable nitro medium, which is the value between the CNM and the WNM. Okay. Or you get a really good view of the WNM only, and no view of the cold phase. So no, this is not considered a data. How hard would it be to do this with, with H1? I think you need SKA, but maybe Eric can comment. It's really the, you need enough bright background sources to be able to measure the absorption phase. Because most just, of the work is done. Just see, when you say it's not known, are you talking only about the circumgalactic medium, or are you saying even for the ISM we don't know? This is for the ISM. ISM we really don't know yeah. how much is cold and how much is warm. I would say to the to the we can't discriminate between the two red curves right now. Yeah, is what I would say. Now is it in pressure equilibrium? Because if it is, maybe the density will tell us. That's very possible. Um, so is it in pressure equilibrium? Yeah. The, the different phases are in pressure equilibrium. Yes, it has to be. They are. Absolutely. Right, otherwise, so the point well, is if you detect the density, well, the maybe that, that's a proxy <laughs> to the temperature because it's the inverse of the temperature. So if you just look at the density distribution. But the issue is there's, there's, clearly, these, there's clearly gas at any different phases. The question is, is it more of a continuum or is it really kind of more well, level? Well, and what you're saying is that we don't know. Well, but if he measures the density, can you measure the density? Well, <laughs> well, we know about 100 lines of sight measuring this basically for local gas. But you just have 100 pencil beams that you then try to compare the absorption to surrounding emission. Yeah. And so, you know, is that cold gas extended? Or, like, is it the emission? It's, it's very hard to make those comparisons. And it's very hard to even, I think, the number of lines of sight that we can do this for all the major line clouds is 50 to 60. The current published data for M31 is 12 lines of sight. It's just very, very limited on how well you can make that measurement, but that's still the gold standard. So we have an idea of what the fractions are fairly locally, but being able to then add additional constraints to then apply that to a number of different models is a big stumbling block. The SKA and NGVLA will get you an order of magnitude more, but probably not that much more. So if you can do this with a million lines of sight and the direct absorption, absorption, that's a very significant Why are we using absorption, not emission? Because the emission would be density squared, wouldn't it? But you're getting emission book from both the warm phase and the cold phase. And the cold phase happens to occupy a very narrow velocity channel in the whole emission. So your, your signal is dominated by the warm phase. So people have tried to come up with different like machine learning techniques to extract the cold phase from a data cube, but it's not, you're not really measuring it uh, isolatedly. So if we think about the simulations for mm -hmm. a second, yeah. um, I totally get why you want to measure this. And, and, but as I look at these, and I think about, you know, for example, the spatial resolution, mm -hmm. it's like the coldest stuff is going to be what you can resolve because, you know, the scale height is smaller the colder you go. And so, you know, is sort of the statement here that, you know, in all of these simulations, on the order of half is cold and half is warm, and what exactly they call the coldest cold is maybe not super well constrained. Like, is that 30 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, or 100 Kelvin? It seems to vary between the two models. Yeah, maybe yeah, I'm absolutely. missing something, but. That is exactly the point, that there's a variety of expectations or theories. So but I just don't know that that's an expectation so much as an aspect of the calculation that isn't well like converged necessarily. Um, so you're sitting right next to two experts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess well, that's, you guys, uh, <laughs> that's a question. I'd be curious to hear what Cassidy. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that most simulations cannot resolve the cold phase very well at all um, because it is generally in very small clouds. Um, so it gets tricky, especially when you're starting to get down to these very low temperatures, you might have gas that is fragmenting to smaller and smaller scales, 
um, that is just going to be below the resolution limit of your simulation. Oh, so that's especially true for galax simulations of multiple galaxies or even individual galaxies. So, for example, well, for example, here the the Tigress um, and I think Silk as well are mm -hmm. trying to simulate a patch of the ISS that is very high resolution, so they can push much for much higher in resolution um, than in any kind of cosmological scale, scale simulation. The issue is then, because when you start getting towards this kind of low temperatures, is that it really depends on what physics you include in your simulation, and whether you have heating from cosmic rays as well, whether you have magnetic fields, and how you, partly how you inject them with feedback, for example, and, and also the feedback itself changes. And that, I think, is the, one of the largest uncertainties in the simula from the simulation process. Isn't the dust also extremely important? Yes. yes. And, and also how the stars are formed and everything. When you start getting down to these low temperatures, you're going to start having star formation. Uh, and none of that is terribly well constrained in the simulations. Then even in the patch of these kind of small patches of the ISM simulations where we can crack up the resolution very high, the star formation is basically all this bit's dense. It's like a sink particle. Is it's that why, if you think of it then maybe, is a CGM in that way some way e easier to think about because there's not star formation happening. So it's, it is more like there's a higher dynamic problem than it is uh, than it is about lots of feedback. In, and yeah, in certain that. senses, I think so. Um, but then the issue that you start to get is that you really do need the cosmological scales uh, in order to understand sort of the initial conditions for the CGM. Um, so if you were trying to resolve very large scales, then that makes it even harder to resolve with very small scales as well. You're saying more like a cosmological simulation with extra good resolution of the CGM. That is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of the, 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 the call it the space between. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the issue we have, I guess, is that um, as well, like we said, we need to have pretty fairly high resolution in the CGM to be able to resolve accretion onto and through the CGM. But also, there's the uncertainty of what you're throwing into the CGM from the galaxy itself, and that kind of because that affects um, the metallicity of the CGM will affect the cooling rates, for example, and that can affect the instability of the developers and blah, blah, blah. And the problem in most of the, the simulations that, that we've worked on in the past is that the CGM is not resolved enough to be able to, stuff just keeps shattering, uh, at least within hydrodynamic simulations as well. Maybe you could start to argue if you have cosmic rays or magnetic pressure to stabilize some common blobs eventually that it wouldn't shattering, but if you just keep turning up the resolution, you get smaller and smaller blobs. And I don't think there's a good solution to that yet. In theory, you start to converge in mass, roughly, right. but, um, but we don't know fundamentally what structure, what the structure distribution of black is. So just in case it was missed to the rest of the crowd, the, the simulations in the bottom panel are not CGM simulations. They are attempts at resolved ISM simulations. So this is not separate models going in. This is at least I mean, some separate models about star formation and stuff. But it's an attempt to at least resolve the ISM actual gas scales down to their intrinsic resolution. So the fact that there's still a variation at this level really does mean that there is physics that must be accounted for um, in that simulation. It's also worth noting, too, that these different types of simulations, because they're only resolving a small patch of the ISM, yep. uh, they tend to choose some parameters for Close to the solar circle, this is what we think the ISM looks like, and then they simulate Absolutely. that pitch. And uh, maybe there are some small variations there, but it's definitely not going to be probing like all of the galaxies' ISM. Yeah. So I saw a diagram once that was sort of like a, a phase diagram, and people were talking about the fluxes between different, you know, regions. Mm -hmm. And presumably that's what fills in this middle between the cold and the warm um, is stuff moving one way or the other. And so how does like comparing the fluxes in terms of like phase transitions of gas parcels compare to looking at an instantaneous distribution? Is that useful? Is that done? Is that it's also that I've looked at particularly. I think, yeah, the, the, it is worth saying this is obviously constantly changing these distributions because of cooling one way. If you're injecting energy from feedback, the other way, you're kind of jumping all over the place. Um, and Tigress, etc., also has 
the hotter phase two of 10 to the 5 to mm -hmm. 6 Kelvin 2, which is not even on this plot. Yeah. Um, or, <coughs> I, yeah, <coughs> so I'd be interested to see what, what we're going with. I think it looks like it. Okay. Uh, what what, what the phases point. are you referring to? If you have neutral medium, you have hot and cold. Well, I was just thinking in like density temperature space. The, uh, you know, if you put a tracer in there, it'll go through transit, like that, like gas parcel will be hot at one moment and then over time it'll run into something else and cool off and then it'll go back. So there's like constant, it's not that there is one chunk of cold gas and it sits there forever. It's that it's all like some big mess and it's always changing states. And so that's what I was referring that, there that are I had seen of, somebody talking about. There are a lot of simulations that do that on very sort of idealized, like here is a single cold cloud, or yes. then it interface between hot and cold, yeah. and then tracking the fluxes sort of through that interface. Interesting. Uh, and that's, Interesting. I think, what this top right panel in figure four is. Where you have like these instabilities sure. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. There are, there are efforts cooling. to try and put those into subgrid models within these yes. larger scale yeah. simulations. I don't see how you can do that because surely thermal conduction is important for yeah. the transition. Yes. I bet these guys can't really do the thermal conduction part because that's a transition layer which is really nav. John Gummer has thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, and then you have to worry about separation. You know, I was interested to get that scale. Okay, yeah. Right. Some good. That's the way to go. Yeah. You can't really yeah. do the physics. Yeah. But but Jesse, what's the blue line? Oh, the blue line is a 2D model from actually like 20 years ago. 10, so 15 it's, years it's, ago. it's out. It's out, yeah. It's out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fine. So there is this phase where actually, um, so if you look at the blue line, it's less bimodal than, than the 3D lines. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, was a, there was a time when, um, where, where, People put in these, you know, stellar feedbacks into their ISM models and found that it's a distribution, not bimodal. But more recent simulations like TypeRes really do show that there is a bimodal distribution. And Eric, the, I think the phase they're referring to is the un, unstable neutral <coughs> medium, which is the valley basically between the cold and the warm. So it's not a different phase necessarily, it's just unstable. Um, Actually, could you remind me about something else? Yes. So, this whole this thermal uh, instability in the ISM and multiple phases, it's very obvious between 10 to the 6K and 10 to the 4K. Mm -hmm. Just the cooling function does, you know, crazy things. What is the physics of the 10 to the 4 versus 10 to the 2? Is it again an opacity related thing or is there? Yeah, why are there these two stable states? with something unstable in between. I would assume it's a balance of the cooling, as you said, and also feedback from stellar environments. Right but by. does the cooling function have a, a big feature at 10 to the 2K and then a valley and then again at 10 to the 4? I don't think that. I think the original George Field thing was essentially a, a balance between heating by photons and cooling. And it's you know, one of the S curves where you can yeah. find a value where heat and heat uh, balances cooling, but if it's sloped in the wrong direction, it's right. unstable. But isn't that the 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6? And 10 to the 6. Also, and and also the, there's also the 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 2. I mean, isn't it just a cooling curve? The cooling curve peaks yeah. and goes down and goes up again. It's just the inflection points in the cooling curve. It's more liberal. Yeah, yeah, but how yeah. many features do you have? Because <laughs> you've got three stable states now. Yeah. Isn't it so like molecules? That's molecules. That's and 20K. Yes. That's the other another state. No, but like I, I thought about like, you know, when you go from ten to the four to ten to the three, you're going from ionized hydrogen to atomic hydrogen. Good. And then as you go down further, don't you like go from forming some molecules and those start affecting your opacity? At, I guess that's know, my question. Is that what is happening at ten to the two? Is it dust? Is it molecules? I don't know. Like when I think about opacity across that range, that at less than a thousand is when you start forming dust. Sure. Well, it's mostly dust uh, that brings you to that temperature potential degree. Then there is CMB, but it's much lower. <laughs> the dust, the uh, cooling versus heating depends on the start. <coughs> but you 
original calculations, I don't think they had appealed to opacity. It was, I think it was just a, it was just a cooling curve. Cooling, yeah, but, yeah, but they're related. Yeah. But what's, what's dominating the cooling? That's right. the question. And is it dust or is it the molecules? I always thought the molecules are for the molecular clock, which are even colder, yeah, right? Exactly. Right. Now see. we are talking about the three hydrogen maybe, maybe dust. The cold, yes. and there's the warm, and there's the hot. Yes, yeah. there's fine structure lines from carbon oxygen, <coughs> depending on the conditions within your ISF, those do the majority of the cooling between those oh, two. Interesting. And then I think the heating can vary based on the You're saying if they dominate over dust? Yes. Producing a different temperature at the so it so makes it the feel I assume. Alright, we got 60 minutes on the one page to go. So I'm gonna play. <laughs> Alright. Um, so that, that was all the reasons why we would like to talk about cool gas and so you need. So just take a brief second to talk about well, what is there in the data right now? I think there's a few really interesting ones. Um, one is the sort of fine spatial structure of the ISM. So in the top three panels, I'm zooming into just one patch of the ISM in which DESI happens to have a lot of background galaxies. It's a galaxy cluster, actually. Um, and the middle panel is showing you what the H1 column densities are in that zoomed-in panel of the, of the sky. It's like around 20 square degrees. Left-hand side is the low-resolution stacking with sodium D. So your stacking circles are bigger, your points are bigger, but you have more galaxies inside. The right panel is sort of the smallest I would ever go, which is uh, in a survey level, um, which is a much smaller stacking circle, and now you're covering a lot more ground with different types of uh, targets in each circle. So the features you see on the left and the right, so the, the low resolution sodium D and the H1 are actually quite similar. As you expect, sodium D is more clumpier and less sort of linear um, as the H1 maps go. Um, we already saw that in the previous scatter plot where we scattered the small scale nodes and the large scale nodes. And on the far right plot, uh, what you see is that when you really just ramp up the, the, the spatial resolution, you see tons of smaller features pop up that were not in this you know, large stack region. And I will note that on the bottom right panels on, on each panel, um, there's a small little yellow bar that represents the size of the stack that went in. So if any structure is larger than that little yellow bar, um, the targets in each pixels are completely uncorrelated. So if you see a linear fe feature that spans multiple of these yellow bars, that is a feature of the data, not like a smoothing effect. Yeah, it's really hard to see. Yeah, it's, it's quite small. One Jesse, is Jesse, what's the galaxy distribution doing in here? You say it's a cluster of galaxies, but it's how yeah. much of that is contributing to the structure here? Um, so this patch of the sky actually turns out to be quite smooth. There are like hot spots where we have a lot more galaxies, and in those spots you'll have less uncertainty in your sodium D measurements. But I have a threshold actually on the sodium D uncertainties anyway, so a lot of that is not present in this map particularly. But I'd be happy to show you on that for afterwards. Do you have like fiber collision issues with DESI? I mean, is there a a fundamental limit to size? Oh, absolutely, but not at the seven arc minute level. Uh, that would be at the arc second level, yeah. At the arc second level? Yeah, because right now even the smallest map is seven arc minutes um, pixel size. So it's much larger than the five collision limit. Um, OK, so that's the local ISM. In the middle panel, we're lo talking about the more distant stuff, like the CGM. And of course, in the Milky Way, we have these lovely things called high velocity clouds, right? shown in figure six, first panel. Um, this is an all-sky map of high-velocity clouds detected in H1. Um, this is from West Fire et al. 2018. And you can just cross-match this catalog with what we have. Because um, if you remember from figure two on the back page, we see a tons of these high-velocity features. So if you cross-match those high-velocity features in sodium with the high-velocity clouds in H1, um, you get the scatter plots on the right panel. So y-axis is H1 velocities, x-axis is sodium velocities, and the second panel is y-axis H1 column densities, and x-axis um, sodium, uh, so, sodium suggestive column densities. 
So the first thing is the velocities are really in good excellent agreement across you know, all of the high velocity clouds that you detect from minus 200 kilometers a second to plus 200 kilometers a second. But the interesting part is the densities. So if you look at the sodium suggested densities, they are a lot more dense than what is suggested by H1. And you should also remember that the H1 map is actually coming from a lower spatial resolution scan of these HPC clouds. So very well what could be going on is sodium, with its high angular resolution, is probing a colder and a denser component of these HPCs. Um, so with help from, help, help, help from Eric Hosh, uh, we have some VLA um, observations uh, queued for some of these higher uh, calm density sodium high velocity clouds. And finally on the bottom panel, um, this is again a project I'm starting with Eric. Um, we can look at not just the Milky Way, but also the local group and things that are extragalactic. So figure seven is sort of, sort of showing um, the M81 group, which is a nicely put, uh, photo photographed by an amateur astronomer actually, and neatly labeled with their components. Um, it's a group that is actively in interaction with one another. So M81 and M82 are the big hitters, but you also see tons of other sort of diffuse things in the middle. So we already have this region in the sky in our default sodium map. And that is the first of the three panel figures labeled sodium D um, BLSR. So the middle panel shows you an optical where M81 and M82 are, right? So they're shown again in sodium in these green little crosses. So M81 is the lower green cross, M82 is the upper green cross. And on the far right is the VLA image um, at you know, really high resolution of what this interacting system looks like. Sorry, so that, that first picture should be rotated? Yeah, it should right. be rotated. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and you're not looking at the galaxies, but the CGM around them? Yeah, exactly. Because M82 has got a whole mess of stuff going on. Yeah, as you can see in the VLA image, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and just a reminder that, again, the issue with hydrogen is you're seeing both the warm phase and the cold phase, at least in the H1. Um, and when you look at the sodium D, you see that there is both the spatial and velocity coincidence with these um, VLA structures you see in the halo of M81 and M82. And assuming that sodium D is indeed tracing most of the cold phase, um, this is convincing evidence that there's cold gas being exchanged between these two systems as well. And of course, whether this is stripping of M82 from M81, or if it's outflows, or if it's cold gas that's already in there, that is growing due to these thermal instabilities, that is up to simulations to decide. But um, the idea is to take this to our more close neighbors, such as M31, M33, and perhaps other you know, LMC as well, as the SMC and other local nearby systems that you can see from an aerial perspective. So that's some of the features of the data. And um, the reason why I think simulations are really critical in this endeavor is precisely because we would like to understand what really is going on in full phase in these galaxy simulations, as we've seen before. So that's all I have for this last slide. Papers. Um, I'm happy to continue the discussion. I have a question. Um, in this uh, sort of middle panel, the, the sodium D line mm -hmm. velocity, mm -hmm. do you also have a map sort of on this same uh, geometric space showing the strength of the sodium D? So I'm curious how that, that, <laughs> yeah, that lines up with sort of the disk, weird, complicated disk structure you see in the Yeah, yeah, we, we do have that map, yeah. But this is the nature of paper that you can't <laughs> pull out the backup slides. <clears throat> top row on figure five, are the color scales set to the same range? You know, we'll have to do corrected for the factor in figure three. Um, with the sodium, so. Like between H1 and sodium, should I take, like I'm looking at the upper right of the diagram and I see a bunch of sodium dots mm -hmm. and I see darkness in H1. Mm -hmm. Is the color map in such a way that I should have seen them if they were at the same I don't think they're scaled to that level right now because it was more scaled to visual appearance, like how many features you can see. Um, but no, because right now they're just equivalent with, I haven't scaled them to compensate the baseline. But I would expect so because if you look at the relative brightness of the features, right, um, the relative brightness of the spots in sodium maps are not like that huge. So I would not expect there being a huge difference in H1 compensates. 
that you scaled it. If you had a high resolution spectra, yes. would you be able to do this with individual galaxies? That's the first question. Um, secondly, if you found like a club of galaxies nearby to a region where you would find lots of these bright patches mm -hmm. and so do you. Could you start I basically would like to know if you could get we could get some good constraints on the size of the absorption features of the clouds or whatever. Um, from yeah, I guess higher resolution individual things that are close to each other, etc. Yes, so what I'm really excited about is Yamas is a new instrument, it's an IFU um, on Magellan in the south. Um, and there, you know, it's an IFU, so you get basically spectra resolved within a few arc seconds and um, spatial resolution. So if you point that towards a, an extended feature like a galaxy, I think you'd be able to probe the absorption at, you know, that tiny, tiny arc second level fluctuations. Um, but that is not a problem well posed for DESI, for example, where... Yeah. I guess I was thinking, yeah, I guess suppose you could... The issue I feel you find there is having a good enough galaxy model for the different parts of a one galaxy. What I was thinking is if you kind of have the centers of multiple galaxies that are nearby to each other, you could get some form of constraint where your model is still reasonable for just the whole galaxy. Um, that's possible. I, I have a sense that, um, I mean, the thing about Yamas, I guess, is that the spectral resolution isn't amazing. But if you had good spectral resolution, I think you could divide up the galaxy model. Because again, the features you're looking for with the ISM are like very narrow. Um, and you kind of know their rough velocities. So People do this with lens galaxies. You know, if you have a galaxy that's spread out into an arc with a bunch of bright knots, then you mm -hmm. can look for absorption towards each individual knots. So has anyone done that in the Milky Way? I know people have done it with unresolved binaries, but I don't know about <laughs> lens quasars. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my question, kind of similarly. What's the status, and this is a totally biased question, what's the status doing this with stars and not doing with that kind of galaxies? Yeah, so uh, we've all talked about galaxies. Galaxies are great, but stars are even better uh, because you have distances. So uh, the status is, is not suitable for DESI per se because, again, the spectral resolution is not great and the stellar absorption tends to be large, like wider than your sodium absorption, so it tends to saturate where your sodium line would be. But with high resolution instruments, I think you can totally separate out the stellar model and then get basically distance information and do a tomography with, um, with the CGM as well. And right now, you could do things like uh, with PHBs, they're just really, really hot, so they have less sodium in the atmospheres, and you, they also happen to be really good distance tracers. So you could try doing this with MMT, uh, which we are trying to do, and also with K giants, they're super bright, um, and with high enough spectral resolution, you could divide up the stellar model. Um, but yeah, it just open like a whole different world of data. So. It has been done, um, not for sodium D as far as I'm aware, but people do use halo stars in Milky Way, um, primarily looking for sort of intermediate and higher ions. Jesse, yes, I kind of missed the point of Figure Six. I didn't understand the, the right panels, the rightmost panels. Rightmost panels. I, I yeah. wasn't sure <laughs> what how you're doing it and what you're. Did, you know, deducing from that. Absolutely. That is time. Absolutely. Um, so what we're doing here is we found sodium D counterparts to H1 high velocity clouds. Um, and the nature of high velocity clouds is a thing that people like to talk about. So in velocity, they seem to align with each other. So the things that we're probing in sodium are likely embedded with these H1 high velocity clouds. But if you take the density um, inferred from figure three, you get a scaling of sodium D density, column density, to H1 column density. You can scale the measured sodium D equivalent width of these high velocity features to an inferred H1 column density. So to put them on like an apples to apples comparison. And there you're seeing the fact that the inferred densities from sodium D is much larger than what's measured with the H1 emission maps. So this could suggest that there are colder and denser um, components within this HVC that hopefully you can resolve with high resolution. That's where I'm lost. Yes. If I look at figure three, figure three, I look at the bottom right panel. Mm -hmm. That looks a lot like this other figure you're showing us, figure six right panel. Mm -hmm. So, is that what you're saying? 
that the figure three, what you call large scale, resembles your HVC clouds? Um, not, not quite. It's not yeah, the same thing. To me, so. that's what I would say visually <laughs> that yeah. this guy, yeah. yeah, whatever, is like this guy, whatever. But you're making some other deduction here, and that's where I got lost. So the deduction here is we're adding the small scale and the large scale because we're looking at total H1 con density. So what you should be comparing is the leftmost panel, okay. not the not the smaller panels. Okay. Yeah. Because when you combine. When you look at the total H1 con density of that high velocity cloud, it is much smaller than what is suggested by Sylvia. So we're not isolating out the large scale. We're looking at the total summed con density. But that could maybe suggest that the HVCs might fall into that large scale bin more so than the small scale bin. Because if you if you're looking at everything, it's supposed to be this linear relation, mm -hmm. but it turns out that it doesn't work out that way, and it looks more like the large scale. So that interpretation would directly lead to the same interpretation being like there are small scale clumps within right. the HVCs. So they're, they're, these are the same thing. Right. So you, I would say that HVCs are mostly smooth, but they have tiny little core clumps. Or that, I mean, yes. That, that is, I think, the sense you're going to look at. But there's a very strong selection function here, too. Yeah. Right? Like you wouldn't have seen something. If there was a point along the one-to-one -one line down toward the bottom, you wouldn't have seen it in, in Sylvia. Yeah, so this is not a statistical claim about all HVCs having clouds. It is more saying that for the HVCs that we've detected, there better be something going on in there. Um, does that make sense? I mean, we're not even actually sure like what the spectra of HVCs are. Like their size distribution and what their mass distribution is. So I don't think I'm claiming a general claim about the HPCs. Okay, well, we got to our time limit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.